to be here with you today. Here's the little over voice that we all got. Our first reading today is from a wonderful little book by Adrienne Marie Brown called Emergent Strategy. How's my, um, how's my volume? Are people hearing me okay? Great. And, and this, this quote is actually another writer in her book by the name of Malkia Devich Cyril. And Malkia is talking about water. Malkia says, from water, I have learned to move around and past fixed objects to reach my goal. From our winged kindred, I have learned that there are times to swarm and that such a swarm can take down even the largest and cockiest predator. But the most important lesson of all for me has been how history embeds itself in every living thing. The land speaks to me in a much longer time frame than the one my body understands. It reminds me that ours are generational fights that are passed down like legacy. The earth in the way it spins under our feet, changing while no one is looking, reminds me both that what we win today can be gone tomorrow and what we lose today can be won tomorrow. The only constant is change. That is nature's greatest lesson to me, that change is inevitable and time is unfathomable. It means I can keep going when all else seems to fail and fall around me. Nature is the source of my faith. We'll come back to that reading a little later. But first, first we'll read our second reading, which is from the Gospel of John. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted, any who are thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Those who believe in me, as the scripture says, from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Here, Jesus was referring to the spirit, which those who came to believe were to receive, though she had not yet been given since Jesus had not been glorified. Several people in the crowd who had heard the words of Jesus began to say, this must be the prophet. But others were saying he's the Messiah. Still others said, surely the Messiah is not to come from Galilee. Doesn't scripture say that the Messiah being of David's lineage is to come from Bethlehem, the village where David lived. So the people were sharply divided over this. Some of them even wanted to arrest Jesus. However, no one laid hands on him. I am getting my little tech going here. Bear with me for one moment. There we are. It's a delight to be preaching here with you again today. Would you join me in a prayer? Holy one that flows, that carries us, that nourishes and quenches our thirst, be with us today as we explore a little bit of your word, a little bit of the way your word can flow in us and in the world around us. In your many names we pray, amen. So as Kip has shared in recent weeks, he and I agreed to explore a different lectionary resource for the month of August. It's one written by Will Gaffney and it's a women's lectionary. And in it, she has taken various scripture passages, offered her own translations and commentaries on each one. Of the choices she offered for today, I ended up landing with this passage from John. It's a passage that I'm guessing many of us have heard many times over the years, but whether it's deeply familiar or brand new to you today, I invite us to look at it with fresh eyes and to see what we might discover. In particular, while we could, while we could spend a, a really juicy bit of time focusing on that latter part where everybody kind of got up in arms about who Jesus was or wasn't, and whether he had the right to say the things he was saying. Instead, I want us to focus on the earlier part of today's passage, to really hone in on that short passage where Jesus speaks about living waters. With that flowing river, I want to suggest, that emerges from the innermost part of one's being, and which quenches a thirst in a way that nothing else can. I want to play with you today with the notion of water, of that river, 
and to see where the current of that river might take us in our sermon. And so I invite you to breathe with me. Let's breathe and let's let the river carry us. So as we are beginning to allow the current of the river to carry us, I'm almost imagining like one of those summer's days where you can go and just sort of lay back and let the water carry you. Laura has introduced me up here in the Finger Lakes to this beautiful little swimming hole where we can go on a hot summer's day and, and just let the water hold us. While we are sort of imagining into that, I wanna start with a little bit of a confession. Sometimes when I'm working on a sermon, I enjoy being a little bit of a word nerd. I like looking at the specifics of the language and almost kind of playing detective and seeing what I might learn when I do that. And so I wanna invite you right now to be a little bit of a word nerd with me. And I wanna particularly zoom in on those two sentences where Jesus speaks aloud in this passage. And in fact, the translation I read, which was the inclusive Bible said, Jesus shouted. I found myself fascinated by the word choices used to describe the person who drinks of this living water, the person that Jesus is describing. And so I started doing a little word nerd investigating. I looked at the New King James Version, which says, and I'm, I'm going to, if, if we were looking at this on a page, I would have these particular words that I wanna highlight in caps. So I'm gonna just kind of do a little air quote to sort of highlight the words I want us to really zoom in on here. The New King James Version says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I actually think maybe I'll skip the air quotes. I'm guessing you can hear the air quotes in my voice. In Gaffney's translation from with the, the focus on, on really highlighting the voices of women in the Bible, it goes like this. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, woman or man, come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from their belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the inclusive translation, which is the one that I tend to most often use these days, says this, any who are thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Those who believe in me, as the scripture says, from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I was fascinated by these subtle differences. On the one hand, maybe they're just slight superficial differences in translation. On the other hand, I find myself wondering if in some cases, very specific word choices can have a lot of power, especially when they describe who gets to access what Jesus is offering. To put it another way, who gets to drink of that living water? Come on, Care, you might say. Surely you are overstretching the point a bit here. Come on, do you really think that people are gonna get up in arms about a word here, a word there, a pronoun here, a pronoun there. Let's hold that thought, that question for a moment. As we ride the river's current, down a little tributary maybe that takes us for a moment out of New York State for me or Pennsylvania for you or wherever you are dispersed on your holidays. Let's breathe again and let the river carry us. And I want to share a brief story. I was recently invited to offer a workshop. It's one of my sort of um, trademark workshops that I call Supporting Gender Diversity in Challenging Times. And I was invited to offer it at a conference in November to uh, a large group of people that do consortium work with colleges. Anyways, the details aren't important, but it's a conference that will take a bite out of my budget, but will probably be significant for me professionally. And it's a topic I really want to share as widely as I can. The conference is being held in North Carolina. And so I did my research as I often do when I travel these days. I looked up on uh, one of my trusted resources, this map that covers the entire United States and offers a state-by-state -state graphic of the levels of risk for trans folks to travel to those particular states. Side note, if this is intriguing to you, if you wanna check this resource out, I recommend looking up erininthemorning.com. It's spelled E-R-I-N. If, if you don't catch this, I'm happy to email it to you. 
where you can see this map and how Aaron has analyzed each state's laws and arrived at these risk assessments. At any rate, I did my research and I saw that North Carolina's kind of middle level in terms of risk at present, but Aaron is estimating that North Carolina is likely to grow significantly more hostile to trans folks over the next couple of years. I will add that it actually has gotten a little bit or a lot worse even this week because North Carolina just recently passed some laws prohibiting gender affirming care for trans minors. So I was doing my travel research and I had to think for myself, okay, how do I feel about traveling to North Carolina, knowing this, a state that is at best lukewarm to my existence and at worst where I might encounter some hostility? Am I ready to navigate the practicalities of public spaces and in particular public restrooms in the airports and in the conference space? All of this research and planning and risk assessment has become a regular part of travel for me now. Not to mention the inevitable misgendering I experienced with the, trans the TSA at the, you know, when you do the security screening and the very predictable and uncomfortable, uncomfortably intimate pat down that I'll get at the TSA gate because my physical body doesn't align with what the scanning machines and the TSA agent think it should. This kind of research and preparation is pretty run of the mill for me these days. It's part of what I navigate when I travel. Um, pro tip, <laughs> one of my own travel strategies, when I'm, especially when I'm flying or if I'm going to be doing a lot of truck stops, is to deliberately stop drinking water or anything else for several hours before I travel, effectively to choose to dehydrate myself on my day of travel so that I don't have to use public restrooms as much. There's a reason why many trans folks have a higher occurrence of urinary tract infections. Now, I don't share this bit of my personal narrative to invite concern or sympathy. I'm actually a pretty loud self-advocate, as many of you know about me by now. And I'm someone with a fair degree of privilege. I'm white. I have access to resources. I have a job that allows me to be outspoken and to advocate for myself without putting my job at risk. But there's a lot of folks for whom it's not that clear or that easy. A lot of folks in North Carolina and Tennessee and Kentucky and Florida and so many places where right now, even the ability to go to the bathroom has been legislated. And so coming back to our water metaphor, in those instances, it's not even a question of who gets to drink the living water. It's a much more plain and gritty and survival level question of who gets to pee. And let's be clear, the US increased restrictions are not just about bathrooms. As of June of this year, more than 500, 500 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced across 41 states and 220 of those have specifically targeted transgender individuals. Things like sports participation, bathroom and locker room access and medical care have been targeted as wedge issues. Many of those laws have been passed, but some of them have also been successfully challenged in court and overturned. And just as a side note, let's be clear, science and research doesn't bear out the concerns about any of these issues, about sports or bathrooms or gender-affirming medical care. And preventing gender-affirming medical care runs counter to medical and psychiatrically recommended best practices. It's estimated that hundreds of thousands of trans people have now moved to a different state, a new kind of internal refugee crisis. On June 6th, the Human Rights Campaign issued a national state of emergency for LGBTQIA plus Americans. They've also issued a guidebook offering suggestions for people who need to move to a refuge state, as well as action steps for all of us to respond to what's happening nationally. I think it's also important to be really clear about what we're talking about here. The majority of these laws are being funded by a handful of heavily funded religious organizations that name themselves as Christian and are putting millions of dollars towards restricting people's right to safe access to abortion and restricting the rights of trans people. We're talking here about laws that mandate that if a teacher is aware that a student wants to change their pronouns, the teacher must report the student to their parents. Let's be clear about the risks here. 
with the high rate of homelessness for many trans youth whose parents aren't able to come to terms with their child's gender identity. We're talking about laws that criminalize the provision of life-saving gender-affirming care to trans youth, and in Florida, even to trans adults. Some would argue that we're talking about the systematic legislative attempt to erase an entire group of people. You know, I, I remember 10 or 20 years ago feeling like my battle for pronouns, for the appropriate pronouns that I used at that time was a very personal and private battle. I felt like I was kind of one of a very small handful of people dealing with this. I even remember looking on the internet to see if other people were talking about it. Somehow now it's become part of a national debate where I and hundreds of thousands of other trans people are being used as political footballs. But it's not a game, of course. For many folks, it's life and death. It can feel overwhelming, like we're being swept up in a current, a raging river, if you will, that is beyond our control. We're back to that river. Let's breathe. And let the river carry us. In recent weeks and months, I've been profoundly heartened by the writing of Adrienne Marie Brown. She reminds me that in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles, love and liberation and transformative justice find a way. She writes at length at the ways, about the ways that nature can teach us how to find our way to this healing and justice. Water is one of those teachers. Water teaches us to be creative in our movement work, to find new ways to flow in and around and through and to work towards change. As Kip spoke about last week, to find ways to make obstacles work in a new way that support us instead. Remember those birds that took those steel spikes and made nests out of them? I'm thinking here of the, the river of justice of the multiple states that have now put laws into place protecting trans health care, prohibiting criminalizing uh, people who provide it, and effectively creating sanctuary states for trans folks. New York State, where I live, is one of those sanctuary states. I'm thinking here of the rivers of individuals and organizations who are organizing and mobilizing in response to these laws, doing the hard and necessary work of resistance, support, and liberatory change. I'm thinking here of the rivers and the currents and the tributaries that are doing the intersectional work that recognizes that none of these issues exist in isolation. Trans issues and climate issues and issues of systemic racism and so many others are all interconnected. They are all part of this great river. I'm thinking here about the kinds of rivers that the prophet, the prophet Amos talked about when Amos said, let justice flow like a river and righteousness flow like an unfailing stream. In that same book, Emergent Strategy, Aisha Schillingford reminds us, water is versatile. It can be big and powerful. It can quench thirst. It can be healing. It can drown us. It finds its own level always. That is, water is always seeking balance and has a place it has to go. It can be scarce. It is necessary. We're utterly, devastatingly dependent on it. It's beautiful and tragic, and it feeds us sometimes. I'm going to ask our, our amazing tech person to pop up the image, the first image on the slides right now. Many of you have probably read about this 150 year old banyan tree in Lahaina, Maui that was devastated by the wildfires there. What we're seeing in this first image is the way the tree used to look. And now with the next image, we'll see the way the tree looks now. They say that there is life underneath that all of these 36 aerial roots, those are roots that, that kind of come out from the tree and then find their way into the ground and the main trunk, that there is life under all of those roots and under the main trunk. 
the arborists that are working with them said that the tree is in its own version of a coma, kind of a tree coma right now. And so they're working to aerate it and to help it receive the water and nutrients that it needs. They say that only time will tell if their interventions will help the tree to heal and to grow again. And they might know it by something as simple as a tiny bud appearing. The arborist in the interview I saw the clip of said, the tree is gonna tell us what to do. The tree is gonna tell us what to do. Water is always seeking balance and has a place it has to go. As Malkia Devich Cyril reminded us in our first reading today, from water, I have learned to move around and past fixed objects to reach my goal. The land speaks to me in a much longer time frame than the one my body understands. It reminds me that ours are generational fights that are passed down like legacy. The earth in the way it spins under our feet, changing while no one is looking, reminds me both that what we win today can be gone tomorrow and what we lose today can be won tomorrow. The only constant is change. That is nature's greatest lesson to me, that change is inevitable and time is unfathomable. It means I can keep going when all seems to fail and fall around me. Nature is the source of my faith. One more time, let's breathe and let the river carry us. May we learn from the power of the river, of the trees, of the water. May we be nourished and sustained by Christ's living waters in our own work for justice, for liberation, for healing in our lives and in our world. Let us drink from those living waters to sustain us, to strengthen us, to inspire our creativity in all kinds of justice work. And may we know that we are held in this work by the one who created us and grows and flows and transforms with us each and every day. And in this work and in this flow, this river's flow, may we find God's good news. Amen. <laughs>